I'd like to welcome Mr. Hansen to the stand. All right, all right, all right. Way to go. You can see why this is such a great place. I mean, to, to uh, I, I finally tell the story of when Tyler toured before when he was shop, shopping for yeah. schools. And, you know, to have a relationship with a, with a, with a, with a young person for that many years and to watch the development and the joy and the confidence and the perspective and the wisdom is really uplifting for us that got to work with you, Tyler. So this is always your home. You're always welcome here. And, and uh, you're, you're part of this great family and this tradition right now. So that's pretty cool. Pretty cool, huh? So um, I want to make sure we, we spend some time talking about what the school is and um, what teaching and learning looks like in this day and age, in 2023, and what we're doing to be absolutely the best school and maintain your pride in what we do, and to be attentive to the traditions that served you so well and served Tyler so well, and that will serve well the people that come here for the next 100 years. Right? So um, public speaking uh, is not one of my fears. <laughs> so. Um, I look at some of my colleagues uh, because they might say it's one of my vices. So I apologize uh, if I go on a bit, but I'm very enthusiastic about this place. I scribbled a, a title on my remarks. I, the, the title of this is, We Are Not a Museum. We Are Not a Museum. I got nothing against museums, right? My son is a PhD uh, anthropologist and archeologist, mostly because mom and dad took him to every county museum and side of the road monument that we could because those were the vacations a teacher could afford in those days and, then, and it shaped his life. And so museums are really important um, and they make tangible the social and economic developments of people over time, you know, that you can go in there and you can feel like today is an extrapolation of yesterday. That's what museums are all about. And you feel a connectivity to something grander, but a museum is a collection, it's a noun, it's a preservation. And when you come to a museum, you look back. But when you come to a school, like you have today, you look forward. You look forward. I know this is an alumni reunion. We're savoring these memories. But your question to me should be, what's going to happen tomorrow? What about next year, the year after that? Are you doing for children today what you did for me 40 years ago? Are you doing that? A school is a verb. A school is a verb, not a noun. In late June, late June is different than late October or mid-February or April after spring break, right? And it's kind of awkward for us to be here that work here. We're like golden retrievers without tennis balls right now, you know? Um, preparing for what we can't prepare for. That's coming our way. When students are here, we're a body in motion, right? We're loud, we laugh, we seethe, we work, we produce, we create, we sing, we debate, we run, we fight. We sing, and we think, and we get along, just as you guys did when you were here. And I listen to the stories, you know, I get the chance to talk to, not just this weekend, but I get the chance to visit with lots of alumni in, in my unique position. And uh, a few things that I note. You were all not good all the time. <laughs> you know, be honest. Be honest. Uh, and some of the loudest laughter I hear and the memories that people share with me are the things that you probably wouldn't tell your kids or your grandkids. You know? And the same is true today. The same is true today. And it gives us gray hairs the same way that it did the major, Mr. Shin, JD. So that's part of it. That's part of growing up. The other thing I noticed is that when you were a child, I hear these stories over and over, I heard a bunch of them today. When you were a child and you came here for a reason, people come here for a reason. They don't come here because it's the closest school. They come here for a reason. And it's people at an inflection point. They needed something. They needed something different. Something different from their family, something different from their education, some kind of change. And what's a more generative time than that, to be at that inflection point in life, right? The right time, the right time for Leland Ott to enter somebody's life. Same is true today. That was true for you. Young people, 
ready to make a move, ready to do something different in a positive direction. That's why people come. That's why they came in 29. That's why they came in 39. That's why they came in 59. That's why they came uh, today. Same reason. Same reason, right? And the other thing that's very characteristic is you tell stories about your teachers and how important they were. The things they said. The things you remember that they don't remember that they said. Right? The pat on the back at just the right time. You don't remember that. But that changed lives. And you felt supported by a team of adults and a team of peers who were going through the same thing that you were going through. And these adults pushed you out of your comfort zone and gave you a glimpse of what life could be like for long enough that it stuck. And you went off and did fantastic things with your courage and entrepreneurism as parents, as community members, as business people because of that glimpse of what you had, of what would be possible if you discovered your capacity. And those heroes that you have, I'm gonna tell you this team that we have here today, they have the baton, right? Uncle Whit to Norm Wheeler, right? To Elizabeth Blunt. The Carters to the Hoods, right? The Munhalls to the Diamonds. People who have worked here 30 years and still have more energy every day that, the, that they come in than the kids do. So you should be very proud of what's happening here. That magical feeling of staff, that continuity, that baton has been passed. And these are the people that Tyler Peer will talk about when he comes back for his four year three year. Right. So to be an educator, and, and Rob said it, is to, is to believe. And it, I mean, that's, that's too cheap of a word to believe. That's not, that sounds like a choice, but it's to be in communion with the truth that education causes change. We cause change. Learning causes betterment, right? Knowledge fuels innovation, and curiosity is a lifeboat to an otherwise boring life, right? And you got to support that curiosity. It wasn't the summers that these teachers chose. It wasn't the summers off that your teachers chose. It was a sense of purpose to be a part of something bigger. That's the yoke that teachers put on their back because they want to do something great for others, for others. So to be a school is easy. To be a good school is hard. Right? It's to build an environment where that learning can take place. An ecology. To build an ecology, give, build a place where something can live. A garden with rich tilled soil. Right? With lots of sunlight. And the water is the celebration of the successes. That's what grows the garden. A place where curiosity begets wisdom, and wisdom begets empathy, and empathy begets service, and service is happiness for the rest of your life. That's what teaching and learning is. It's not a bar chart. Right? So this school is not a museum. It's for now, and it's creating a future, as it always has. Leonor is a living thing. Constant growth and adaptation evolves with the generation. We're now responding to the advancement of technology, the availability of information, increased knowledge of how the brain develops, things we didn't know 30, 40 years ago, understanding of mental health issues and how that affects our ability to, to discover our capacity, the integration of cultures, all things we know, the, the dynamic social fabric of the world that ebbs and flows, right, the economies, the politics, the pandemics, these are the things that we have to deal with. But we've always worked to remain relevant, to remain safe incubator of a sense of belonging, wisdom, and determination. Just like the school did for you, we do today. So what are the challenges of now versus the challenges before for your current staff? How would you like to be a teenager today? How would you like to be 13 or 14 years old today? Mm -hmm. On the one hand, it's not a substitute. It's an honest question. On the one hand, material blessings overflow, don't they? Grocery stores with aisles and aisles of cereal. <laughs> a whole aisle of toothpaste to choose from. That's pretty cool, right? I can buy something with a mouse click and I can get it tomorrow delivered to my door. Right? Pretty cool. I can watch Hank Green on YouTube. Right? I can consume TED Talks before school. <laughs> 
I can learn a language on Babel without even telling my parents that I'm doing it. I can communicate to almost anybody in the world just about for free. Just about for free. I can explore different cultures. I can form relationships from hundreds of miles away. I can travel, and I can eat cheeseburger flavored Doritos. <laughs> Kids today got it made, don't they? Got it made. I can be bullied by a complete stranger on the other side of the world. I can be diagnosed with school-based anxiety and depression at age five. I can view TV at any age. I can watch horrific violence at any age. I can do that on a handheld device from anywhere in the world. I can be held back in school if I don't score well on a standardized test on some Wednesday in March. I can be told, put down the Play-Doh and grab your mouse in kindergarten. I can read the comment thread on a tweet and see how meanness has become currency. I can see how adult, adults behave. I can be sexualized, body shamed, experience racism from bots and stalkers and fame seekers and the great anonymous cowards on social media. And I do. I can be shot while eating lunch in my school cafeteria. I don't know that reality TV is not real life. I'm told high drama and instantaneous reward is what life is supposed to be by TV. I will be made fun of for being happy, and I will be insulted for experiencing success. This is the world today. But keep in mind, my students, no students, put nonstop violence on TV. That wasn't them who did that. They didn't put television on personal handheld devices. In fact, they didn't buy themselves their first cell phone. The students didn't do that. The students didn't cause their parents to divorce, their father's alcoholism, or their mother's cancer. They didn't invent social media. The gangster persona, that was invented by my generation, not theirs. Right? TikTok was done to them, not for them. They're not the ones who have normalized anger as a problem-solving technique. They grew up watching it. They didn't demand the invention of bubblegum-flavored vaping pens, and they're not the ones who voted to legalize marijuana in your community. That wasn't them. They didn't make the rules during the pandemic. And they don't write the lesson plans in the classroom. Right? They can be told to look at their fingerprints when they're little kids and say, you are unique, there's nobody just like you. And then we can put them in the world that's based on dichotomies, that sorts and selects, based on objectives set by adults that they've never met. Judged by people, anonymous people. That's the world that we inherit. They are, as we were, as we are, a product of the environment we're raised in. At home, in the media, across society, and in schools. Where they spend the majority of their childhood. So here we are, as we've been for 94 years, and here they come. As they ever, ever do, as they always do next September. Here they come. And are we ready? Are we ready? So back to the museum thing that you thought I would, forgot about. Um, <laughs> it used to be that a school could be like a museum. The keepers of the canon, the holders of the historical record, hired experts, a physical repository of materials, right? They were in schools that come sit at my feet and I'll share with you and I'll enlighten you, right? Not bad, very successful way. Uh, everything I learned in elementary school came from the 1957 World Book Encyclopedias in my school library. In, in 1976, I had to do a poster presentation on the Western states. I got a C, because I didn't have Hawaii and Alaska on there. But you know what? It was only a C they didn't fail me, because I wasn't expected to know everything that happened yesterday. I, didn't ex I wasn't expected to have the wisdom of an adult at age 11. 
like we expect students to have today, right? Now schools are less docents of museums showing artifacts and authors and scientists, more to navigators, helping students and children make connections to the information that's overflowing out of their pockets on their devices. Not just info, the emotions they experience, the conflicts that they witness, the responses, the messages, the images that bombard them through media and unlimited access. So much incredibly good and so much danger, both just unrelenting. Sort that out at 13, right? So I guess my point is people are growing up faster than they did when I was growing up in the 70s. And I don't mean puberty, although there's scientific research about that. Maybe puberty started faster too. I don't know, I'm not talking, I'm not saying people are maturing into well-adjusted adults faster either. I'm just saying that the exposure that accumulates in life happens at a much faster clip than it was when I was a teen. Much faster clip. The miles people are putting on at a younger age these days. We rack them up. And oftentimes it results in amazing stories of entrepreneurship at young ages, people doing remarkable things, producing fantastic art, not necessarily in school, mind you, the things that they could do, right? I know students who, who know more about Picasso and Niels Bohr than I do when they come here, right? They find inspiration from foreign poetry. They teach me about it, right? They found it on their own. They're just so much older now. But the flip side is true, too. Emotional maturation is not keeping up with all the volume that's available. Not for us as adults and not for young people either. We don't have the skill set to process with perspective all the good and bad that we're experiencing, that we're seeing, that we're witnessing. It gets really, really hard to feel safe. Really hard to feel safe. Belonging is as fleeting as the current group chat. Thus a crisis of anxiety, depression, apathy, anger, abuse, addiction. Once adult problems, now inflicting children at record levels. So that's the hard news, and I'm sorry, that didn't sound very good, did it? But I'm a positive person, and this is a positive school. So I'm gonna tell you the good news. Here's the good news. Here we are, as we have been for 94 years, and here they come, as they do each new September. That's the good news, because we got a chance to help. And that's why Leland is here. We got a chance to help. To be a healing school. To be a healing school in this day and age, just as it was healing school in your day and age. It requires an evolution with the times. Not in commitment to meeting needs, not in changing our mission, not in chasing a niche, niche group of people, but in the strategies to deploy to meet those needs. That's what has to, that's what changes, right? To be a micro environment of safety and a larger environment of threats where children can be heard, learn, and feel safe. The primal needs of all humans don't change, right? And this is science, right? Uh, we, need, we have a sense of survival. We're gonna make decisions based on the survival. We're gonna make decisions based on a sense of belonging. We're gonna choose belonging. We're gonna make decisions based on a sense of independence, you know, self-power, freedom, those types of things. We're gonna make those decisions and we're gonna choose things that bring us joy. Those things always happen. William Glasser, Circle of Courage, you, you, pick, you pick whatever, research you want, it always comes back to those things. And we get to create that environment, productive ways to, for children to make decisions to get survival, belonging, independence, and joy. Because we don't give them safe ways to do that, they're gonna find them in other ways. So are all of us. We're all gonna choose things to create a sense of belonging. Are we gonna, are, are we gonna choose belonging that's healthy for us, or are we gonna choose belonging that's unhealthy for us? Because we're gonna choose belonging, we're gonna run to it. We get to build a place where they run the right direction. And we get to innovate ways to stand in the winds of the negative pressures. In other settings, schooling, unfortunately, is not, not always a means to learning anymore. Or belonging. What's measured is not always a predictor of success. What is offered is not always empowering or joyful. 
What is celebrated is not often a service to the world. Too many young people are enduring school instead of thriving and learning. Complying instead of engaging. Collecting the points. Give me those points. Give me those points. Extra credit. Right. Extra credit, please. Yeah. yeah. Learning to follow instructions instead of leading in innovation. Learning how to make the teacher happy. Make the parents happy. Instead of answering their call. Far too much genius and talent left on the table out there. We, Leelana, exist as it always has to stand in contrast to that. And the contrast is only getting louder. It's a shame about that pandemic, huh? We lost seven points in math. But what did we learn about us? Nobody talks about what we learned in the pandemic, only that we lost seven points in math, fourth grade scores are down. <laughs> the heck? Come on. It's an independent school who bears the responsibility of inventing and advancing best practices. Because we're the ones who have the agility. We're the ones who have the, the uh, governance freedom, the instructional freedom, the curricular freedom to try and experiment and do things. And I'll go further than that. It's the small independent school that can be the most agile and can work together as a team to try things and then try something else tomorrow and move quickly to meet the needs of the students in front of them instead of something else like the chasing. So what do we do here at Leland, right? We're an intentionally small school. I want to talk about that a little bit. Intentionally small. Students are fleeing larger environments. You know why they're fleeing? Because they're not heard. Competition is the coin of the realm. They're jumping through hoops. The rush of the day is inhumane. Four minutes passing period. Raise your hand if you want to go to the bathroom. We got apps now where you have to request on your phone, can I go to the bathroom? It goes to the central office of big schools. And they say yes or no, you can't go to the bathroom. You can't go to the bathroom right now because one of your friends is in the bathroom. So kids are using their phone to relieve their bladders. Not here, right? Students don't like that. 